Hello, I'm Roger Gosden, speaking to you from Williamsburg, Virginia. Thank you for joining this webinar. I'm focusing on Robert Edwards because Bob was called the father of IVF. Although science is a community endeavor, leaning on many contributors, I have time to mention a few. Brilliance and dogged determination were needed for a revolution in fertility medicine. But nothing could be achieved without the courage of patients, skill of team lead members, and the scientists and doctors who laid foundations. Before Louise Brown, it was said IVF was impossible. Or if it was possible, it was wrong. I remember even in Bob's lab, there were whispers he was wasting time because we knew how hard it was in animals. I'm going to show you Bob in 1999, still in his prime, editing journals, collecting awards, lecturing around the globe about IVF and its spin-offs that had started to conquer infertility for millions of people. The future of IVF. <coughs> I don't know who gave me this title. Uh, I can't see the future. It takes a long time to see the end of the week at the moment, the future of IVF. At least I'll do my best. Now, the purpose of IBM was not only to alleviate infertility, it never was. The future of IBM. IVF wasn't his original idea, nor was he the first to try. Twenty years earlier in Massachusetts, Gregory Pincus and Miriam Menken tried with rabbits. And when he left Harvard, she was recruited by the gynecologist John Rock. They collected over 800 oocytes from ovarian tissue, but claimed only two or three fertilized and cleaved. Although reviewers have discounted them as fragmented cells or parthenogenesis. Their greater achievement was from flushing embryos after timed intercourse for the pathologist Arthur Hertig to create a famous reference series at the Carnegie Institution for Embryology. There was surprisingly little stir in Catholic Boston. Discouraged by IVF, Rock joined Pincus to develop the oral contraceptive pill. The Chinese-American biologist M.C. Chang was recruited after his PhD in Cambridge, England, but was more interested in embryology than endocrinology. In 1959, he reported the fertilization of rabbit eggs in vitro, a first in mammals. Had he been interested in human fertility and Rock not occupied with hormonal contraception, their collaboration might have won the prize of the first IVF human baby for America before it became a politically hot potato. Bob was born in Yorkshire, England in 1925, the second of three sons growing up in the industrial city of Manchester. His father was a miner. His mother worked in a cotton mill. There wasn't much money and working class boys had slim chances of entering the professions when British society still had a rigid class structure. The bright boys won places to the best local school. But when Manchester was blitzed in the war, their mother sent Bob and a brother away for safety to a farm in a remote part of North Yorkshire. It was too far for school, so they became farm hands. Bob loved it, and an interest in biology and genetics was sown in the urban boy's heart. Returning to Manchester, he quickly made up lost lessons to qualify for university, but first came army service, where his commanding officer promoted him to a junior officer. In 1948, he enrolled at University in Wales for agriculture, but he despised the unscientific curriculum. After two years, he switched to zoology, where the professor inspired a love for embryology and genetics. Without enough credits for an honours degree, or money to stay on another year, he left miserable without a qualification for PhD training. Wondering what to do next while working in Manchester docks hauling bananas, he wrote in a wild moment to Professor Waddington in Edinburgh, 
the man who coined gen epigenetics to apply for a diploma course in animal genetics. Waddington offered him a place and Bob succeeded so well, he stayed on for a PhD and then for a fellowship. It was in Edinburgh where his talent and enormous capacity for work unfolded. He published 55 papers for seven years of research and married a clever student who collaborated to develop superovulation in animals. She was Ruth Edwards from a celebrated scientific family that included the physicist Ernest Rutherford. Bob was on his way to stardom. They moved to California, then London, finally settling in Cambridge with five daughters. He was funded for immunology of reproduction, specifically a contraceptive vaccine against sperm. But his heart wasn't in it. He continued to study eggs and embryos in spare time. But the last year of his London appointment, 1962, he spent in Glasgow with cell culture experts. They created the first embryonic stem cells from rabbit blastocysts. And with Richard Gardner in Cambridge, they used biopsies of trophectoderm to sex rabbit blastocysts, which pointed to pre-implantation genetic testing. These projects were years ahead of their time. His dream of developing IVF drew a step closer when MC Chang fertilized rabbit eggs. Among several applications, infertility was low on the list until he met Patrick Steptoe and learned that Patrick patients had few options for treatment. He asked London gynecologists for spare ovarian tissue to harvest oocytes, but they thought he was crazy and only Molly Rose and one other offered help. Oocytes were sucked out of follicles and matured in vitro, a technology we now call IVM. It took nearly two years for a breakthrough because he had only about 50 cells until a visit to Johns Hopkins Hospital to work with Howard and Georgiana Jones, who supplied wedges of polycystic ovaries. That year, 1965, he published a comprehensive agenda for IVF in The Lancet, which attracted attention in newspapers. It was the start of a stormy relationship with the media. Based on Chang's authority, he thought oocytes generated by IVM were poor material for IVF. Although we now know they can succeed, if less sufficiently, and are used to produce bovine embryos commercially. But when he returned to Cambridge, IVM was his only option. A student, Barry Bavister, was having success with hamster IVF, so they tried his formula with a few human oocytes. As they examined eggs hour by hour through the night, they saw all the stages of fertilization. It was a momentous breakthrough, proving human sperm don't need time in the female reproductive tract to capacitate, which Bob had thought was a huge obstacle. He wanted the best quality oocytes from follicles shortly before ovulation, but for once was stumped for ideas. How to collect them safely, efficiently, ethically? What woman would consent to a laparotomy or surgeon put patients at such risk? There was a gynecologist from a Northern hospital in the audience of a London conference in 1968, whom Bob only knew from an earlier phone call. He was Patrick Steptoe, the pioneer of laparoscopy in Britain, who came prepared for battle with doctors who thought it was a dangerous continental invention. When Patrick stood up to defend his invention, the penny dropped for Bob to realize that this was the answer. This chance meeting led to a historic collaboration. Their alliance stretched 200 miles from Cambridge to Oldham in the north of England. They expected success in two or three years, but it took 10 and many road trips. The challenges were daunting. There was sparse knowledge about human embryology. They had to decide if 
and how to adopt hormonal stimulation, hitherto only used for anovulatory women, or to try natural cycles instead. If they triggered ripening with HCG, when should they inject, and how to aspirate oocytes from follicles? They needed to develop culture conditions for gametes and embryos. And then, what route should they take to place embryos in the uterus? And was hormone support with progestins needed? The questions were endless. The program opened at Oldham General Hospital on a shoestring budget in 1968. Bob applied for an MRC grant to fund research and bring Patrick to Cambridge, but it founded on objections that their work was unethical and wasn't grounded on monkey studies. Nevertheless, they had supporters. Most important were patients who came for their last hope of children. Bob's wife, Ruth, gave untold support and he recruited Jean Purdy, a nurse who became a skillful lab assistant. Patrick had a loyal team of nurses under Mira Harris, working on social hours without extra pay. Bob's boss, Bunny Austin, was one of the few Cambridge academics who encouraged him. Lillian Howell, an American heiress, made secret donations that he said saved the program from financial collapse and Oldham Hospital managers provided material and moral support. The Ford Foundation of New York funded a broad range of research over 20 years, but as the controversy grew, they didn't want to be acknowledged in his human embryology papers. They transferred the program two years later to Kershaw's Cottage Hospital, a few miles away for greater privacy. The labs were Spartan, and the team had to beg for spare equipment or buy second hand, even dipping into their own pockets. They only had the bare essentials, and because gas incubators weren't available, they had to make do with a chemical desiccator to hold the petri dishes. It was filled with a special gas mixture for the correct pH and warmed in a standard incubator. This is how the cottage hospital looks since it became a hospice today. The space they use is hard to identify now. In the 1970s, the team recorded their methods with a 16 millimeter camera. It shows Bob, Jean and Patrick and is narrated by Patrick Steptoe. The droplets of cotton medium into which the spermatids are out of place is being prepared. First, a sterile petri dish is poured with sterile liquid paraffin. And several droplets of counter medium are placed beneath the surface on the base of the petri dish. Here the aspirator needle is being introduced into the abdomen and is approaching the ovary. Here is a good ovarian response to the gonadotrophins. A bluish pink follicle about one and a half centimeters in diameter is present and the needle is pierced through an avascular area and gentle suction extracts the follicular fluid. The appearance of pre-ovulatory oocytes is typical for they are surrounded by a thick viscous mass of mucus containing diffuse various tumor cells. Classification of the oocyte enables the pre-ovulatory follicles to be identified and most of them are found to be the largest follicles in the ovary. Non-ovulatory oocytes are surrounded by several layers of tightly adhering corona cells, and oocytes are considered atretic if there are no attendant corona cells. They were scrupulous, counseling patients and choosing cautious protocols. They tried for perfect conditions, and no detail was too trivial. 
After patients were selected by diagnostic laparoscopy and seminology, ovaries were stimulated with low-dose pergonol HMG and or Clomid, aiming for about three ripe follicles. In the last year, drugs were abandoned for natural cycles by monitoring the menstrual cycle calendar and detecting the pre-evolutory LH surge with a new Hygonovus test, which set the time course for laparoscopy. Urine was collected and tested every three hours, round the clock. At first, the efficiency of collecting ursites through a single core needle was low, so they invented a new device with a valve to control pressure from a pump. Bob learned how to transfer embryos at the famous animal breeding research station outside Cambridge, where the transcervical route was used for cattle embryos, flushed out of tracts after in vivo conception, for transfer from high to low genetic value animals. Patrick adopted the method. By the way, IVF was only successful to date in rabbits and rodents, and not achieved in cattle, until Benjamin Brackett in 1982, and afterwards by Barry Babister with rhesus monkeys, both of them based in the United States. With mild stimulation at Oldham, they had few embryos, and blastocysts were rare, although prized for tighter synchrony with the endometrium. Had they transferred more, they might have had earlier success, but dreaded multiple pregnancies. The stiff catheter used for transfers might have contributed to implantation failure. And the Wallace catheter was developed later by Patrick's deputy, John Webster, and a small company. And this made a huge difference to results. Let's re review this timeline from start in 1968. There was tremendous progress at first. Collecting and inseminating oocytes became routine, and many zygotes cleaved. Jean Purdy spotted the first two blastocysts in 1969. Bob fixed embryos on slides to check if chromosome numbers were normal diploid. They were, but it was a minimal test, all that was available then, and was hard to sacrifice embryos after so much effort. By the end of 1971, the team was ready to transfer embryos to patients. None implanted, and progestins didn't help. There followed four hard years. In 1975, they were elated with a clinical pregnancy at last, but tragically, it was ectopic, and the woman never succeeded after many tries. Patrick sealed the tubes in future, so it couldn't happen again, and to rule out the possibility of natural conception mistaken for IVF. In desperation, and with Patrick's retirement booming, they opted for the high-risk strategy with natural cycles for their final year at Oldham. They weren't alone in the world now, as their efforts encouraged doctors in Australia, led by Carl Wood and Ian Johnston, a smart and well-organized group. They reported a short-lived pregnancy in 1973, but it was their last pregnancy until a baby was born in 1980. There was less competition from America. Landrum Shuttles at Columbia University, known for a discredited method of choosing a baby's sex by timed intercourse, wanted to get back into IVF. Had he recruited Miriam Menken, he would have done better. But in trying to help a Florida couple, his unauthorized procedure got him in hot water. No one knows what the tube contained after mixed gametes, as it was poured down the sink by his chairman, who then fired him. After Louise Brown was born, there was news of a baby girl born in Calcutta and claimed to be a double first. Conception by IVF followed by embryo freezing. It was a great controversy, and still is, and the doctor responsible committed suicide. A few years earlier, a senior British gynecologist claimed 
there were already two or three IVF babies in existence, but refused to identify them. Eventually, it was agreed the man was delusional, and he entered a distinguished career in disgrace. IVF was dangerous territory. The final breakthrough in Oldham was a great secret until birth was imminent. There were five clinical pregnancies by natural cycle IVF, but only two would reach full term. The first was Louise Brown, born on July 25th, 1978, and the following January, Alistair MacDonald. Leslie and John Brown had tried for a baby for years and had no money for private treatment, but there were no fees for the Oldham program. Leslie was an ideal patient who conceived at the first attempt. She was hidden from the press and her pregnancy went smoothly until near the end. But the problem had resolved when Patrick safely delivered baby Louise by C-section close to midnight. She was perfectly normal and weighed 2.8 kilograms. The news was greeted with great fanfare around the world. And we look back at that moment as opening a new era in reproductive medicine. There had been 495 treatment cycles in Oldham for 282 couples to produce just two babies and a very few clinical pregnancies. But hopes were high. And yet, as they left Oldham, when Patrick turned age 65, where would they go? The National Health Service turned down an application for a publicly funded fertility clinic. The team was forced to go private and dispatch Jean Purdy to find suitable premises. Bourne Hall, outside Cambridge, had none of the assets required, but they fell in love with it. Although the first investors backed out, they raised money to buy the hall and make the conversions. It would take several years, but they were in a hurry and opened a clinic in 1980, based in porter cabins in Forecourt. Amazingly, the first pregnancy was confirmed a few weeks later, and more positive results arrived to make Bourne Hall the largest IVF program in the world, at least for a while. They hosted conferences for world experts, and their research program was a melting pot of ideas anticipating new assisted reproductive technologies. After the first baby in Britain, and then in Australia, his old colleague Howard Jones announced a first in America, and soon afterwards there was news from France and other countries. As the field grew, Bob turned to new ventures. With his French colleague, Jean Cohen, he launched the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology, becoming the founder editor of the journal Human Reproduction, then adding two more journals to foster human embryology and genetics. The journals became best in their class, but he harbored a hope of publishing an online journal which he believed held the future. Now a publishing entrepreneur, he opened Reproductive Biomedicine Online at the turn of the new century, based in an office at his farm. Even in his late 70s, his energy was breathtaking. Dean died in 1985, aged only 39, and Patrick three years later leaving Bob a lone survivor of the trio. He never stinted giving them credit in speeches and at prize giving. Before Patrick died, the pair attended Buckingham Palace for an honor and received honorary degrees. But greater acclaim came later and almost too late. At his Lasker Prize ceremony in New York, a week after 9-11, the DNA pioneer James Watson who had been a harsh critic, now acknowledged the benefits of IVF. It was an award that often forecasts a Nobel Prize, but Bob was too unwell to attend Stockholm for his prize in 2010, or for a knighthood at the palace in 2011. 
He died two years later, but his legacy grows ever stronger. Thank you for watching this webinar. If you want to delve deeper into the story, you might read the biography of Bob and the profits from sales are dedicated to charity. Thank you.